Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Conversations with John, where each week we bring in a leader from across the denomination and just have some conversation with them. I am delighted that this week Maria Coyne is with us. Maria, welcome, and why don't you introduce yourself to our, our viewers? Well, thank you, John. I'm so pleased to be here and uh, always enjoy a conversation with you. Uh, as John mentioned, I'm Maria Coyne. I'm the president and CEO of the UCC Cornerstone Fund. I've been with the fund, gosh, about three and a half years now. Um, realize as many of you I, as I've met, I've probably equal numbers I haven't had the opportunity to meet yet. So delighted to be reaching you through this medium. And uh, Maria, tell uh, for some of our listeners who may not yet know all of the ins and outs of the national setting, what particularly is the ministry and mission of the Cornerstone Fund? Thank you, John. We uh, were founded about 28 years ago. We were actually born out of the Church Building and Loan Fund. I know many of you are familiar with that organization. We work very cooperatively with Church Building and Loan Fund. We were born out of them. They, from a lending perspective, serve primarily newer churches, um, new or renewing churches. Cornerstone has always been focused on churches that have been in existence uh, for 30 years or longer. But the truth is there are a lot of projects we're doing uh, together these days. Cornerstone raises money by selling investments at above market rates to individuals and churches. And then we turn around and we lend that money to churches and other faith-based organizations at, at uh, ideally below market rates. We make just enough money to keep our lights on and, and pay our staff and, um, We've been, uh, we've been blessed to have never had a loss in our 28 years of history. One of the things that I love about working with Cornerstone is that um, I'm a veteran banker. Prior to Cornerstone, I spent over 35 years in commercial banking, and I will tell you that one of the greatest joys of being at the Cornerstone Fund is that we have the ability to work with our churches and our borrowers, even through difficult times, and even when they hit a bump in the road. So. Um, I think that is good business, and I think it's good for the soul of the church, and I'm happy to be a part of it. Yeah, I, I remember uh, your predecessor, Gordon Gillis, coming out to Phoenix, where I was stationed at the time as Southwest Conference Minister, and meeting with a church that was finding it a real challenge to make their payments. Um, and we sat down over a couple of hours of conversation with the leaders from that church, and uh, whereas other banks wouldn't have even batted an eye in, in foreclosing mm -hmm. on the, the mortgage of, that they held on the property. We worked until we, we struck a payment plan that made sense for them, worked with the conference, worked with the local church and with Cornerstone Fund. And it was a great joy to walk out and to hear those members brag about how mm -hmm. valuable the relationship was and how we were there in their hour of need to see them through that time. And within six months, they were back on schedule making their regular payments. So it, it, it happens all the time and it's very gratifying to be able to work through those kinds of situations. Um, your relationship with these local churches puts you in close touch with and, and in close proximity uh, to the heartbeat and pulse of the denomination. And I know it's not lost on you that these churches are traveling through a difficult and challenging time. Because of that, you and the Cornerstone Fund have made some decisions of late uh, about the, the churches with whom you have loans and churches who may be on a vulnerable edge in and through this time. Why don't you talk a little bit about what you are doing to respond to the crisis? Sure. Thank you. That was, um, you know, it seems now like a lifetime ago and yet just the blink of an eye. It was, it was about two months ago at this point that um, our own staff made the decision to start working remotely. And in pretty short order, we started hearing from churches who were, were customers of the Cornerstone Fund. And we decided very, very quickly and quickly but prayerfully that the best thing to do would be to immediately just put all churches on a 60-day deferral um, and it, unless they wanted to opt in and continue making their payments. And we have some churches who've done that. But the idea being everyone just stop, take a breath, figure out how you're going to, you know, conduct your lives in these remote times and get your online worship set up and worry about those things. Don't have to worry about making your loan payment for a couple months. 
And, um, you know, pretty soon we'll be coming out of that deferral. And I suspect we'll be working with churches on uh, even more creative ways to make sure that we continue to um, be able to uh, keep their lights on and keep our lights on at the same time. Um, we did also roll out, thanks very much, John, to the participation of the national setting, a pandemic relief loan program, um, where, whereby both the national setting and, and several conferences have invested funds in the Cornerstone Fund. They've agreed to a, a little lower rate of return so that we could pass that savings on to churches. So we're offering 2.5% um, small pandemic relief loans, interest only, so that the churches can uh, affordably make those payments during these difficult times. Um, and even then, we are, you know, within the realm of everything we do on a daily basis. Um, and frankly, it's the fun part of the job for us, finding creative ways uh, to assist churches through these difficult times. How are you and your staff holding up through this season? Uh, you said two months now you've been working from home. These are unusual circumstances. And, and I know that you and your staff are in service to our local churches, but you're also human beings with lives of your own. How are you all holding up? That's right, John. And you know, you, you had mentioned something actually to me earlier today that got me thinking about how we incorporate fun back into the workplace when the workplace isn't a physical place. And we've always had a big focus on, on wellness and understand that the person brings the whole person to work with them. Um, so we're going to, we're, we, you know, for a while we were having daily touch bases, even if it was a five or 10 minute meeting, simply so that we could see each other's faces and hear your voice and, and make sure that, that things were going well. Um, we've made a commitment to not do any, any downsizing or any disruption of our current staffing. Um, we know that we're going to we're going to need everybody through this long haul, and um, I've, I'm thinking about more ways to incorporate some fun into what we do. We've done a chair yoga session um, via Zoom, okay. and uh, I think we need I think we need a game night or something. We're just going to have to figure that out. So, uh, for those uh, our, our viewing audience who don't know, Maria and I were on a call earlier, and we talked about a scavenger hunt that we did with our entire staff. There were about 110 participants, um, and we had a list of 40 items, and every member in the, we, we split up into three, and every member had to go find at least one item on that list, and they were kind of obscure things. Um, my favorite moment came, one of the items on the list was a child under the age of two, and uh, Jennifer White, a member of our staff, held in her arms her six-month-old baby. Oh, sweet. Um, whose name is River and, and told us the story of that beautiful child. It was, it was delightful. Um, anyway, I, I want to ask, Maria, um, you chose to come to the United Church of Christ and the Cornerstone Fund after, as you said, 35 years in the banking business. I was a part of the search committee that, that I identified you as our lead candidate. I, I had the, the honor of interviewing you for the, the final interview and the thrill of extending the invitation for you to come and serve. And, and I remember hearing you talk about, in particular, a project that you undertook uh, for women entrepreneurs. And I wonder if you would just tell that story as, as part of our conversation here. It's, it, it really, it gave me an idea, not just of how gifted you were, but of how you have this, have had this sense, even while in the banking industry, of this, this call, maybe not ministry, but I, I would argue it is even that, that, this call to use your gifts in extraordinary ways. Uh, to, ben to the benefit of others. So would you mind unfolding that for us? Sure, Jen. I'll give you the, I'll give you the um, Reader's Digest version of, of a program that I founded and was, was incredibly proud of because it was, it was a focus on women-owned business, and it was really about bringing them the full breadth of banking services and not in a way that was just a marketing initiative. I, it was very clear um, in talking with the leadership of the bank at the time that this was real business and we didn't do these business owners any, any um, justice by, by simply putting a pink bow on something and calling it a women's business, you know, like make it like a cute little club. It wasn't that at all. It was about having access to resources, including um, uh, lending that would help 
these businesses grow into big thriving businesses. And in, um, in the 10 years existence of that program, which was right about the time that I left, uh, we had lent over, and this is a large regional bank with a nationwide presence, um, over a 10 year period, we had lent over $15 billion to women owned business. And I just, it, it makes my heart sing every time I think of it because it was, you know, large organizations, it's, it's pretty difficult to be entrepreneurial. Um, but it was an idea that everyone embraced and everyone really believed in as legitimate business, not just as kind of a marketing play. So it's, it's one of the pieces of work that I was certainly most proud of in my career, but um, you know, I'm very, very happy to be here right now. I'm going to, I'm going to recall a part of that story that really touched me when I heard it. Um, and I'm going to do so both because it also says a little bit about your your strategic thinking, but it also, and then I'll tie this into why I'm bringing this up, it ties into the core values that we hold as uh, members of the United Church of Christ and that you hold in your own faith upbringing. And that was that you noticed in the research you did early on that women weren't taking on enough debt early on, that they were almost risk avoidant and that risk avoidance was compromising um, their success later on. And so this program was a way of just, not just, as you say, putting a pink ribbon on something and throwing money at something, but coaching these, these very capable leaders through some challenging times. Just say a word about that. Yeah, that was the, I think the most interesting thing about that work was that you might make a judgment on the surface because of a behavior, but you really had to kind of dig beneath that. So that what appeared to be risk avoidance or, or risk aversion really turned out to be a characteristic where people liked a lot of information before they made a decision, not afraid to pull the trigger once they had that information, but also unsure of how to go about getting that information because our research also showed that Women just didn't have access to the same types of business networks that their male-owned counterparts did. So by simply making access to information, to customized advice, to sophisticated solutions, they embraced it. And they just, it, in a way where it was safe and you didn't have to feel um, inadequate to ask a bunch of probing questions. And it was, it was that kind of context of, no, 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 they'll, they're smart people. And the risk aversion comes from a place of just wanting more information. We can handle that. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to bring that up um, because I, in the United Church of Christ, we have always been about leveling the playing field and making sure that resources were brought to bear to those who were always gifted, but whose circumstances never put them on a level playing field. Right. And, and when I heard that story, I knew, again, we were not just calling an incredibly gifted and talented leader, but somebody with the same sort of core values and commitment to the overall mission that we represent. And I want to make sure that our viewers, many of whom might be meeting you for the first time, know that that's what you bring to the table. So uh, we, thank you. Yeah. Um, and it, it does so beautifully tie into what we're, what we're doing today. I mean, we, you know, Cornerstone's mission is uh, joining together in faith to invest in and build community. So it's, it's in this age of how we take the assets that we have and then we take the resources that we're given and how do we creatively impact our community and help grow community and help grow the body. It's, it's really rewarding. Yeah. Well, uh, I couldn't be happier that you've chosen to locate your ministry and your your talent with us. We have benefited greatly from that, and um, I'm grateful that you're part of the team. Um, I always give my uh, companion in these conversations uh, the invitation for the last word. So as we say goodbye to our viewers, uh, what, what would you like to share with them as a final thought, Maria? You know, I... Um... You made me smile when you mentioned a small child earlier because I half thought I'd have my granddaughter wandering in here and sitting in my lap. She's sheltering us with us at the moment, and you never know when she's going to join a Zoom. 
Um, but I, you know, I would have to say, just I've been a firm believer my whole life that that God has you on a path. And we're silly enough to think that we have control over that path, <laughs> but every chapter leads you to the next chapter. Mm. And I really feel like this is where I personally was meant to be at this time, using those skills that I gained in banking, the relationships that I've had the privilege of growing over the last three and a half years. Um, I think I'm here now for this reason and for this leg of the journey. And uh, I don't think anyone should be afraid. I think together we can get through whatever it is that, that lies ahead and, and we'll do so with God's grace. That's beautiful. I want to thank you, Maria, for being with us today. I want to thank our viewers for tuning in once again to Conversations. We'll be back soon. Thank you for watching.